This is the Watchman giving a clarion call. And today, I want to walk you through a possible scenario that I've been fleshing out in my own mind about what may be possibly taking place on the world scene uh, in the East right now. There are recent events in silver that have caused me to sit up and take notice. For the last several years, we've watched the powerful, unmistakable trends of China, Russia, and India hoovering up tens of thousands of tons of gold. We've watched the fairly recent trend of India becoming a powerhouse in silver demand. We've watched J.P. Morgan become a big silver stacker as well, which I've written about. But a brand new trend might be appearing in silver. And if it's not just a blip, but a long-standing trend, it could be very, very important. And I'll go over why that is. But first, I want to give a quick historical backdrop, something which I learned quite some time ago uh, from uh, fellow silver stacker Brother John F. Several centuries ago, the city of London was beginning to run short on silver and needed to find some new silver in order to retain their monetary power. Now, they had to keep the silver flowing or silver's price explosion would have occurred, upending the city of London's plans to demonetize it, which had already begun, as silver was needed to satiate eastern demand for commerce. They, they were trading with China, especially China and India, and Chinese workers and the Chinese government demanded only uh, silver in payment for their goods and services, something which uh, England was running out of. And not having silver would have caused a huge freeze in trade with India and China, and an upward revaluation of silver, causing the East's star to soar to the heavens, while the Western Bank's powers were diminished. So, the city of London invaded both India and China. They stole their silver, which equaled hundreds of thousands of tons of silver. Get the majority of silver actually ever mined and which actually existed in the world at that time. It ruined China's and India's empires, dethroned their emperors, destroyed their economies, and got their people even addicted to drugs during the Chinese Opium Wars. And finally, it took away their ancient silver standards from their peoples. I mean, China's and Indian silver demands, uh, silver standards, were in place and they're in their economies until the 1930s. Okay, World War II was almost on the horizon when the when the banksters finally forced India and China off of their silver standards. Incredible! It was a wicked. Vicious crime spree perpetrated by the Western banking dragon against nearly half the world's population. There's actually a very interesting movie about that period around the Opium Wars and the fallout and steady decline of China in regards to its silver standard. Uh, and that movie was called uh, The Empire of Silver. It details how uh, China lost its silver and its mojo, its, its long-standing uh, cultural economic power, after the invasions by uh, the city of London. <laughs> Watchman, that's interesting, but what does that have to do with China's recent huge purchases of silver uh, that, that we're seeing? Well, I'm getting to that. China and India both have a remarkable regal history with silver. Nearly 18 months ago, I wrote a series that I think remains one of the most crucial ever written uh, that I've ever written about silver and gold in the Western banking cabal. And that series was entitled the Pressure Point Knockout Series, and it was meant to answer this question. If silver is the kill shot for the banking dragon that's ravaging our world, why don't China and India pull the trigger and end this foul beast's life? Why instead are these major eastern powers going for the gold instead of the silver? Now the theory I put forward back then may play a helpful role today in trying to understand this powerful new trend of silver buying in China. We are seeing a rapid 
massive buildup in silver stockpiling and purchasing in China at the Shanghai Futures Exchange. Okay, the data is unmistakable. As in just the past six months at the Shanghai Exchange, their stockpiles have gone from roughly 7 million ounces to nearly 60 million ounces of silver. 60 million in six months. This means they're buying silver at a far, far faster rate than J.P. Morgan has for the past five years. In fact, they've bought as much silver in six months as J.P. Morgan has in five years. That's almost ten times as fast. Ten times as, as much. Now, this is a huge surge, which honestly, if you look at the face of it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, think about it. Silver right now remains largely a side event in China. Most Chinese citizens still prefer gold to silver, and they buy over 2,000 tons of it per year uh, of gold. The Chinese really don't stack silver as they do gold, at least <laughs> not yet. Silver largely remains a niche market in China. Small and mostly relegated to numismatic products um, is, is what it's used for gift giving uh, for you know they, they like to print these you know little, little uh, monetary bills made out of silver with images stamped on them things like that it only takes a few million ounces a year silver's not the main story in China right now so what's going on here why is China suddenly taking on a much much larger stake in silver buying well, I, I've got a hunch about it, and it has to do with that silver pressure point series I wrote several years ago. I think it's possible this buildup in silver stocks in China could be, be a prelude to China moving into silver in a big way and using it as a final kill shot, the final dagger's blow, if need be, against the Western banksters when the time is right. Remember this, silver is the kill shot for the banksters, the pressure point knockout, but gold is the bank's source of power. If China and India suddenly moved in, swooped in, and bought up all the silver, they could likely take down the system, yes, but have you ever seen the film Terminator 2? <laughs> okay, that's good. Remember uh, the villain in it named T-1000? Remember how in the film they kept shooting and killing T-1000 over and over again, but T-1000 just kept coming back. He kept congealing. He, the pieces, uh, the, the, the fragments of him after being shot would just meld back together, reform itself, and then continue its onslaught. Well, that's kind of how the banksters are, because if their system is destroyed, yes, uh, you know, it, it wreaks havoc on them, but as long as they maintain their golden stockpiles, they can come back together every single time and continue their plans and their onslaught against the human race. China knows that it's the banksters' gold that has to be taken from them in order to take their pricing power of gold and silver away because they had fought them once using silver and they lost because they didn't realize the absolutely extreme quantities of gold that their enemies possessed. And once the, the pricing power is taken away from the West to, to price gold and silver, uh, along with sufficient gold quantities, then and only then can the silver attack angle be taken against this huge banking beast. Now hear me now. If China is doing this, if they're starting to move into silver in a serious way, it's likely because the process of cornering gold could be almost over. Think about it. For the last 10 years especially, China and India have drained several Fort Knox's worth of gold from the West. But China has been moot, strangely moot, on the topic of silver. They haven't really done anything to begin quartering that recess at all, that, that resource at all, except for the considerable silver they mine domestically. And, and, and really, they used most of that for their internal industrial demands and their infrastructure building. 
So this new silver stacking above and beyond seems different. And if they intend to have a silver play, if this is the beginning of that play, they have to have uh, the right game plan. They have to have the power to to end this at any moment, this, this, this huge market rigging con at any moment, and they have to do it right. There's a right way and a wrong way to do it, and there are no do-overs. One misstep in this plan, and so much can go wrong. And very soon I will talk about why I think the time could be right for China to move into silver, what steps the Chinese have already been taking over the last 10 years to lay the groundwork for silver accumulation, and finally, what their plan of attack might be going forward. This is the watchman giving a clarion call. In my last video, I explained the very violent and bitter history between some western banks and the eastern countries they fought against. Those bankers invaded and fought India and China because they needed their vast silver reserves to maintain their monetary power. Now, I laid out the case of why silver revenge by China would be very appropriate, and today I'm going to show our community that the Chinese government is not only very aware of how deadly silver is to their enemies, but how silver could be a two-edged sword that damages them as well if they use it too early. Now, why would I say that? Well, because China is just so large in both population and wealth, and silver so ridiculously tiny, that the slightest wrong move into silver could royal global markets. China is a mega power, and as such, it's difficult to gain access to most markets without upsetting those markets, without spiking them, without tipping everyone else off. Think of gold as a backyard swimming pool. There's just a tiny bit of gold on earth that all the world's sovereign funds, uh, cash and, and treasury markets, money markets, and real estate markets uh, can flow into. Hundreds of trillions of dollars in assets. And if you believe the official gold figures, there's only about $6 trillion in gold on earth. And much of that isn't for sale at any price. Well, if gold's a swimming pool, then silver is literally a whiskey shot glass, <laughs> perhaps even a thimble full of water. After all, there are only a few billion ounces of silver on Earth valued at roughly 35 to $50 billion at these prices. There's so little silver that China's had to avoid it like the plague and even help with the silver market rigging. Now, China did that so they'd have time to acquire the gold first that they needed. That's why China has had to quietly prepare this silver trap in stages, very slowly and patiently. Now, let me walk you through the stages of China's movement towards silver and gold, so you'll see what I mean. You may even want to rewatch this video later if you have to, because I'm going to move fast here, and there's a lot to cover. Step 1. China took the enormous step of legalizing gold and silver ownership for its citizens again in 2003. Remember, before this time, really only Communist Party members had any access to limited gold-silver legal ownership that, uh, that the state Chinese mints made. Silver ownership had especially been made illegal by Beijing since 1935 due to the war on silver by the bankers. Step 2. Just a few short years later, around 2008-2009, the Chinese government began actively promoting gold and silver ownership for their citizens. That's a historic turning by the government of China on precious metals. In six years, they went from outlawing it to actually encouraging their citizens to buy it. It's utterly mind-blowing. Step 3. China actively upgraded their state mints located in places like Shenzhen, Shanghai, and Shenyang to crank out more silver panda coins. Now, folks, uh, most folks don't know this, but when they first started making uh, silver pandas in the 80s, they were only striking about you know, 100,000 uh, coins per year, and most of them were for foreigners. <laughs> but then again... After legalization, they bumped the number of coins to 600,000 per year overnight. And then again in 2010, they bumped it again to 1.5 million. 
and then yet again in 2012, they bumped it to 8 million coins per year. Now, I expect soon when the time is right, Beijing will order the total capacity be bumped again to perhaps 30 to 40 million in order to compete with the U.S. MIM. So you see from the beginning, they've been running a marathon with silver, not a sprint, carefully taking each step only as they were ready. And, and, and get this, the, the 2016 Silver Panda, for the very first time, does not bear the stamp one troy ounce on it. Instead, new silver pandas say 30 grams on them. Very interesting. This is huge. This means that China won't just control the gold and silver flow or even its pricing. They'll also dictate what weights they're considered and measured in henceforth. This is further proof they intend to push the world away from the troy ounce measurements and denominate coins and bars in grams and kilos. Step number four. They went after their enemy's power in gold. Now, the, the bankers in London and New York for centuries have had exchanges which dominated the trade in purchasing of gold and silver. So Beijing wisely realized that it wasn't simply that these bankers had gold, but that they controlled the levers of pricing around gold through highly sophisticated exchanges. So Beijing established their own highly regulated, officially sanctioned gold and silver exchange, the Shanghai Gold Exchange, or the SGE. It's been responsible now for removing over 10,000 tons of gold from world supply and moving it into Chinese borders. It's a highly trusted, highly transparent, and universally respected uh, mint uh, 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 exchange in its business practices. The SGE, not London or New York, is now where the global physical game is happening. <laughs> the COMEX? Uh, are you kidding me? Those clowns are laughing stock. They only physically deliver like 50 tons a year. <laughs> China, Shanghai moves that much around in one week. Enough physical gold uh, has been drained that now step five was possible. China, who'd been pulling the banking dragon's golden teeth from its mouth, now made their boldest move yet. Always remember this. If someone has enough gold to back their currency, they're powerful indeed. But if they have the means at their disposal to price it for everyone else, they're in a league of their own. London has been able to control gold because they've been able to price it. The London fix was simply the price at which major gold buying and selling parties would be quoted each day. And it really was the first mechanism of direct price control. And they were unchallenged in doing this until two months ago when China finally launched their own gold fix and did so with a yuan-denominated gold kilo futures contract. <laughs> this is huge. Now, China can put its own counterweight against London and New York City on the price of gold. And when the time is right, they'll set gold free to find its true value and not before. So those are the steps which have prepared the silver trap. They've taken out the enemy's gold, their, uh, their exchange domination, and paired it with a gold fix priced in Chinese currency. Now the time is now perfect for China to use the silver they've acquired on the sly, and believe me, they've acquired it, to take vengeance upon their foes. And folks, it's not just the huge 70 million ounce surge of buying we saw in Shanghai that I'm talking about. Remember this, Ted Butler has always maintained that if you could look into J.P. Morgan's books on the short side, you'd see lots and lots of Chinese names in that book. He also believes J.P. Morgan has amassed up to half a billion physical ounces of physical silver uh, since 2011. <laughs> Folks, who do you think they've been doing this for? Now, several people like Bill Holter, uh, uh, for instance, have suggested that China loaned several hundred million ounces of silver to the U.S. back in the 90s 
to keep the rigging of silver going longer at that time. It's highly likely that if this is true, uh, it would add serious clout to the notion that J.P. Morgan isn't simply an arm of the Fed or D.C. anymore, but also of China itself. This new silver surge in Shanghai means that in one year, China has gone from exporting 100 million ounces of silver a year to importing 100 million ounces a year. That's a 200 million ounce swing. Incredible. And now that China's acquired the gold, acquired the old J.P. Morgan building and vault in downtown Manhattan, and set up its mechanisms to wrest away pricing power, all that's really left is to exert the smallest pressure on the already strained, busting at the seams silver market and extract their vengeance for the crimes perpetrated on China and India uh, at, at any time they see fit. The Watchmen? <laughs> I don't know about all this. This is very interesting, Watchmen, but the Opium Wars were like uh, 150 years ago. Don't you think they've moved on by now? Now, they're not interested in revenge. They're our business partners. They just want to use us to make more money. Okay, if you think that, you have absolutely no idea who the Chinese are or how they think at all. And I'm going to demonstrate that to you right now in a way that you'll never forget by wrapping this clarion call up with a tragic story that occurred during the Opium Wars. And it was brought to mind by a Shield brother in Singapore. At the pinnacle of wealth in China, when silver literally flowed like water through the streets, their emperor built a magnificent palace called the Old Summer Palace. This palace was unparalleled in beauty and its scale was unbelievable. Now, as the French and British soldiers were marching toward Beijing in that war, they sent envoys to China's Prince Yi under a flag of truce. All the while, British and French soldiers were sent to loot that palace. And upon hearing this, Prince Yi uh, of the Qing Dynasty killed their envoys. He was so angry, and in turn, the British High, Com uh, High Commissioner was so enraged, he ordered the entire Summer Palace be destroyed in retaliation. All of it. That palace was so vast that even with literal armies of French and British soldiers all burning, smashing and looting, it still took two whole days to destroy that palace. To this very day, virtually all of it still lies in ruins. And many have wondered, why hasn't the Chinese government restored this beautiful palace 150 years later? Beijing pretends the reason they don't rebuild it is that they simply don't have the blueprints for it. But everyone there knows that's a lie. They have incredibly detailed plans of this palace. <laughs> no, it's widely understood that the true reason there in Beijing that they never rebuilt the old summer palace is that they wanted each new generation of China to see this great pride of their heritage still broken in pieces on the ground. They want their people to remember the extent of the cruelty they received and feel the fresh sting of humiliation as if it were yesterday. So that when the time finally comes for vengeance, the people will gladly cry out for it. The brothers, would it not be poetic justice, if when the blow of vengeance is finally dealt, that it be made with a dagger of pure silver? Now, I would not be surprised in the least if that's exactly what occurs and soon. This is the Watchman signing off. Stay vigilant and bring the fight to them. And not having silver would have caused a huge freeze in trade with India and China, and an upward revaluation of silver, causing the East's star to soar to the heavens, while the Western Bank's powers were diminished. So, the city of London invaded both India and China. They stole their silver, which equaled hundreds of thousands of tons 
of silver. Get the majority of silver actually ever mined and which actually existed in the world at that time. It would find some new silver in order to retain their monetary power. Now, they had to keep the silver flowing or silver's price explosion would have occurred, upending the city of London's plans to demonetize it, which had already begun as silver was needed to satiate eastern demand for commerce. They, they were trading with China, especially China and India, and Chinese workers and the Chinese government demanded only uh, silver in payment for their goods and services, something which uh, England was running out of. Ruined China's and India's empires, dethroned their emperors, destroyed their economies, and got their people even addicted to drugs during the Chinese Opium Wars. And finally, it took away their ancient silver standards from their peoples. I mean, China's and Indian silver demands, uh, silver standards, were in place and they're in their economies until the 1930s. Okay, World War II was almost on the horizon when the when the bank watched J.P. Morgan become a big silver stacker as well, which I've written about. But a brand new trend might be appearing in silver, and if it's not just a blip, but a long-standing trend, it could be very, very important. And I'll go over why that is, but. First, I want to give a quick historical backdrop, something which I learned quite some time ago uh, from uh, fellow silver stacker Brother John F. Several centuries ago, the city of London was beginning to run short on silver and needed... This is the watchman giving a clarion call. And today, I want to walk you through a possible scenario that I've been fleshing out in my own mind about what may be possibly taking place on the world scene uh, in the East right now. There are recent events in silver that have caused me to sit up and take notice. For the last several years, we've watched the powerful, unmistakable trends of China, Russia, and India hoovering up tens of thousands of tons of gold. We've watched the fairly recent trend of India becoming a powerhouse in silver demand. 